and welcome to John Park's workshop. Those are the bleeps and the bloops. We have both kinds here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and, uh, and coming on over to John Park's workshop. We're going to do some fun, cool, groovy, pixely stuff today. Uh, one of my all-time favorite games in the arcade was Space Invaders, and we're going to do a sort of clone on Space Invaders, a take on Space Invaders today, built entirely inside of Make Code Arcade, if you can believe it or not. Uh, it won't be a perfect replica, but we're going to try to do one that is not super complicated to build either uh, using the blocks. So, so there will be some artistic license we take, but uh, I think you'll, you'll recognize the style of gameplay at least. Um, and let's see, I want to say hi to all the good people over in Discord chat for stopping by. Hello, everybody. And uh, same with people over in the YouTube chat. If you're here watching on Twitch or on Facebook, hello to you too. I'm not monitoring those chats because I, um, I tend to lose my focus if I look at too many things at once. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do is mention our job board. If you have not checked it out, go on and check it out. We've got a, uh, a very fine job board over at jobs.adafruit.com. And uh, if you head on over there, you'll see some cool things uh, such as, let me switch over to that, such as, he said this. Look at these jobs. There's a gyroscopic sensor for performance contract work. Uh, someone's looking to hire someone to do some gyroscopic sensor work, I'm assuming, for performance. Kind of interesting. Let's see, uh, let's find out more. It's by the Midden Heap Project in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Looking for someone to help with a project for a performance. Basic cuts the project to use a nine degree of freedom absolute orientation sensor to turn my moving body into a gyroscopic MIDI controller for video jockeying. Ooh, that sounds really interesting. Uh, so that's just a taste of the kind of uh, jobs that you'll see posted on the jobs board. And the Adafruit jobs board is entirely free. So it's free to post. It's free to uh, put your resume up there if you're looking for work. So go check it out. Um, very interesting. Gyroscopic MIDI. Let me know how that project goes, because I'd like to try that. Uh, now, uh, the next thing I'd like to share with you is our coupon code of the day. So if you were thinking, hey, I might... Uh, oh, yeah, hey, Andy, sorry, Andy Cal... I just got distracted. Andy Calloway over in the chat says he sees a package on the workbench. Will we be seeing a mailbag? Also, sure, yeah, we've got... Um, I've gotten some things in the mail lately I wanted to share. I'm going to share one of them uh, today. I also got a couple of cool uh, things in the mail from C. Grover. Uh, our own C. Grover in the chat that I'd like to share at some point. Maybe I'll share one of them today, but I don't want to run out of time. So, uh, yeah, I'll, you know what? I should probably get a P.O. box or something so that if people want to send in projects uh, or products or whatevers for me to, to show off on the show, uh, within reason, don't, you know, inundate me, but uh, that might be fun. Uh, so the thing I did want to share, though, right now is the coupon code. So for... The Adafruit store, if you go there and grab some stuff and throw it in your cart, if you would like to get 10% off today, then enter in that coupon code. Pew, pew, pew. P-E-W hyphen, P-E-W hyphen, P-E-W. Pew, pew, pew. That will get you 10% off in the store. And I'm pretty sure we allow hyphens. I've seen them before. I don't know if I've used any, but uh, that's good until midnight tonight, Eastern Standard Time. And that's good on all the goods that you can get in the store. Uh, not on software or subscriptions or gift certificates, however. Um, and uh, just to be helpful, our good friend Todd Bott in the chat has uh, offered up my address as 123 Fake Street, Anytown, California, 90210. Uh, please don't use that. Um, I will get you, Todd Kurt. So, speaking of the store, I've got a little product of the week I wanted to share with you, and that is... This little guy here, this is the USB uh, Cat5 cable for adapter for power and data. So I actually use one of these every week on the show. That is how I work the cameras for my workbench. Uh, you may remember I've built this little mini keyboard, which is uh, designed by Andy Clymer, and it uses a Trinket M0, and I use that to switch uh, out the camera when I'm over at the workbench to different views. And it's a USB device, but what you'll see I've got it extended with is about 50 feet of uh, Cat5 cable. 
So this is pretty cool because you tend to have long runs of Cat5 cable laying around, and I'm pretty sure that's a lot cheaper than gigantic USB cable. And I don't even think they make USB cable in 100 foot lengths or 300 foot lengths even. Uh, this thing, I think you could probably go beyond 100 feet for a simple application like this, um, but that's what they rate it for. And so it's a, a pair of these little dongles that go on either end of your Cat5 cable or Ethernet cable as some people call it. And that allows you to extend a MIDI device, or rather, not a MIDI device, a USB device, could be MIDI over USB, but it allows you to extend a USB device a long, long way away. Um, so it has a dongle on the other end with a USB-A, and I plugged that into my hub over here. Then the Cat5 goes all the way around to the workbench, and then another uh, USB from Ethernet adapter on the other end. So. That's my product of the week. Uh, here's another nice little picture of it. You can see that um, gigantor 100-foot Cat5 cable. They're all spooled up and ready to go. And I think it'll use Cat5, Cat5e, and Cat6 is what it says in the description. I don't know if there's other cats on the other ends of those number ranges that are common enough to worry about, but those are the ones that'll, that'll do it. Um, and so that's my product of the week. I think it's a, a, a very, very helpful little gizmoid if you are... Um, can bring up a product page for that. If you are in the business of running things very far away from one device to another over USB, I say check it out. Uh, that is it, the USB power and data signal extender, 30 plus meters, 100 plus feet. So that's my product of the week. That's what I thought you all might want to uh, go check out. I find it useful. Uh, okay, so, hey, hey, no and Pedro, new tunes, you say, yeah, I, um, wrote a very quick little ditty, that little ditty you heard earlier. I, I wrote that 20 minutes ago and uh, I guess I got bored of all my, my existing music. So. Um, so, you know, speaking of music, that brings me to this. Yes, that's right. It's the Make Code Minute. And in fact, I've got a little different arrangement of things I'm going to run with today. Uh, so what I wanted to share in Make Code Arcade today is the basics of using projectiles. So what we've got set up here is I have a background image that looks like this. And I have a player sprite that is a big giant tree. So let's say we're setting a game where this tree needs to feed people or animals or someone. Uh, and so we want the tree to be able to fire off tacos in any direction. Uh, so what I've got set up is four of these on button press blocks, which you can get from this controller section. So such as on a button pressed. Uh, and from that drop down, I've chosen the up, left, right, and down uh, direction pad keys on the on the controller. Uh, and then I'm using from the sprites section, there's this set projectile to, uh, and then I'm choosing a sprite, and I'm actually grabbing this taco sprite from the gallery. So if you look here, we got a bunch of fruit up at the top. I decided the taco was nice. And I'm going to project that projectile from my sprite, which is the name that tree sprite has, in a particular direction. And so this is actually a um, a vector that says we're going to head out uh, on the, when we press the up button, we're going to head on negative y, which is up in, in this world here, uh, vector, and the opposite for down, and then on x for the right, and negative x for the left. So you can see what this looks like if I go ahead and make this big, and then I can use just the, the browser controls or my keyboard, and now you can see I can send out uh, tacos in any direction. Now that's going to, uh, the frame rate is going to stutter a little bit, I think, on the um, broadcast here. But you can see I can press multiple buttons at once. In fact, I can press them all at once and get beautiful little starburst patterns of uh, tacos coming out or do something like that. Um, so I don't have any other gameplay built around it, but that is just the very basics of how do we fire off projectiles inside of Make Code Arcade. And then you can upload that to a um, board if you want. Let's switch to this down shooter for a second. And 
you can see here I've got a new piece of hardware. This is the Pi Gamer. Just came in the mail today from Lady Ada. And you can see I've got my little sketch loaded on there so I can use this D-pad. Now this one has a different D-pad. This is actually an analog, so I can, I can send diagonals. Um, but I can't send all four at once because it's an analog stick that goes in diagonals, not pressing all at once. So there is my taco spewing tree in action on hardware. And so that is how you send projectiles inside of Make Code Arcade. Uh, we had a question in the chat over on YouTube from Dave Estelle's about asking about programmable courses uh, such as parabolic arcs. So um, there is a, an extension if you look inside of the um, advanced section of Make Code Arcade. Actually, I can, I can show you where this is. So let's um, pop that view up again. So if I head to advanced and then open up extensions, there is this... Uh, extension called Darts, uh, and I haven't used this enough. I'll, I'll just be dangerous trying to explain it or use it at this point. Um, but that adds up here in the uh, categories of blocks, Darts, uh, and then I think you can uh, do some more advanced projectile throwing that that travels along arcs. Um, but I could be wrong about that. I know you can set it up so that it shows you paths which is kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to try to try to mess with this right now because I'll just be flailing around. But I think that may be the place to check out versus the regular uh, simple projectiles, which are, are more meant to be sent um, in a straight path. So check out the darts extension and see if that allows you to do things like arcs. Because yeah, that would be really fun to do something like a game like Worms. Uh, it would be a lot of fun to try to try to create inside of Make Code Arcade. Uh, if you could have uh, the angles and uh, uh, vectors and magnitude for sending little projectiles like a mortar shell over to blow up some other worms or just to arc some tacos into a bucket. Uh, so that uh, is our project, or, or rather our make code uh, minute for today, but it actually leads nicely into the... Um, main project of the week. And so the main project of the week is my, uh, let me switch back over to this view, switch tabs. This is my uh, Sparky Invaders game that I'm working on for a guide for this week. So uh, let me pop me up into there. We'll be, we'll be staying here for a moment. Uh, so let's have a look, first of all, at the gameplay as it is right now. So I'm going to open up the um, simulator here and make it real big. Uh, and so you can see I'm, I'm adding a couple of extra features to this one compared to our typical um, project I've been doing over the last few weeks inside of Make Code. So I've done some uh, just how you create sprites, how you create animation. Last week we started doing some level design for a side scroller. Um, this one I'm adding something like this um, startup screen or title screen, which is, a, I'll, I'll show you how that feature works. Um, so you'll notice the first thing that happened is that it brought on, actually I can, I can restart this, you'll see it'll bring on this effect of a star field. I set it to just a couple seconds right now, just since I'm iterating on it, it gets annoying, but it, ultimately I'd probably have that run for about five seconds, so it kind of fills the screen with the, the stars. Then it pops up our little title, and you can see this is uh, a little indicator in the UI that tells the user to press the A button to get past that screen. Uh, and now we have our game. So there's Sparky down at the bottom. And I can move Sparky around with my arrow keys. And I can... Let me highlight this so that it works better. Whoops. I can get hit with... There we go. Uh, so now I can... Oh, I may have broken something in the most recent version. <laughs> He's not moving well. Uh, now I can move my Sparky left and right, just like the ship in Space Invaders. And I can send a uh, missile or projectile, which is an electrostatic discharge that Sparky is using to destroy 
these integrated circuits, these little dip uh, chips that are coming down. Um, a couple other features to look at. We've got uh, a single projectile at a time. So if you are familiar with Space Invaders, one of the things about the gameplay is that you can't just spam the button and send a bazillion um, missiles all the time. It actually limits you to one of your projectiles expiring before you can send the next one. Uh, you'll also notice I have, um, ooh, I just barely got missed by that, but I have consequences to getting hit. So there I just got hit for the third time. There are three hearts. If we, if we restart this, you'll see. Um, so there are three lives to begin with. Um, and those will uh, get reduced each time you get hit, each time Sparky gets hit by one of the chips. Uh, you'll also notice the scoring. So if I shoot one of these, I get 50 points. If one of the chips reaches the little barriers without me blasting it, I lose 50 points. So now I'm actually at a negative. Um, and I don't think, yeah, so we're not losing any points if they make it past us without hitting us. So those are sort of three uh, different ways that the, the chips can get by. You can blow them up, they can make it safely across, or they can hit that barrier. Um, and that's about it for gameplay. So let's, let's look at how this is working. And I'm not sure, let me just test it over here. Yeah, I'm not, I think it just was not liking being full screen and playing with uh, some of my other software running. but but. I'll, I'll confirm it on the device. I think that's, that it is actually running smoothly. Um, so I'm going to hit stop. So one thing when you're working in Make Code Arcade, you want to hit uh, stop in this simulator. When you're uh, working over here, it'll speed up the browser a little bit, and then you can hit play. This is the beta version. So I'm actually, um, let me reload this. I'm using arcade.makecode.com slash beta, and then that'll take you to the home page. And then if you create a new project, it'll go into this uh, editor mode. So. Let's look at how things are working. First of all, uh, I'm zoom in here a bit. I am now taking some of the uh, stacks of blocks and breaking them off into a couple of functions. So you'll notice my on start block is not humongous. Because um, very often when you start out inside of Make Code Arcade, you can stuff a whole bunch of things inside of, excuse me, inside of that on start block um, that set up your game, but it's a little unwieldy. Ah, delicious club soda. So you'll notice the first thing I'm doing is I'm setting my volume. Uh, you didn't hear it there because I'm not porting sound out of the browser, but you will when I play it on the handheld device in a second hear, hear sound stuff. Um, so I'm setting the volume to something low. I think the default might be 20. Um, so I'm setting it a little lower than default. Uh, then I have this start screen star field effect. So You'll notice everything's color coded. So if you're wondering where uh, any block came from, you can look over in the left here. So it's from this scene block, uh, since that color is this slate blue. So in this scene block, I'm grabbing uh, that screen effect, which here it says start screen confetti effect. Uh, I chose that uh, star field from the drop down. And if you hit this plus sign, it'll allow you to just play the effect for a certain amount of time, uh, like a half a second in the default. But I'm going to let it run the whole time. Then I am pausing. This is that pause where I said I'm letting it pause, uh, run for a couple seconds before it does uh, pop up the screen. And then this screen splash is in the game category. And we can see there's this prompt uh, subcategory and this item splash. So I'm throwing in uh, this name, Sparky Invaders. Uh, if you hit the plus sign on this, I guess you can do uh, a subtitle on this. Um, let's say the game. I should probably have that in quotes. So let's see what that does. And you can see here why I don't want a long pause on that star field effect, because it gets old. OK, yeah, so that'll give you a, um, oh, and it looks like you don't, yeah, you don't need to enter your own quotes. There we go. So Sparky Invaders, the game, uh, will appear there. And it looks like you only can add, add one uh, subtitle to that. So then the next thing I'm doing is I'm calling let me stop the game over here. The function called Sparky Setup. So if you head to the advanced section, there's these functions. Um, there's nothing here to begin with. You make your functions as you go. And the function is just a way to uh, store a set of blocks that you kind of want to group together logically, um, organizationally, just to get them off to one side. It's a chunk of, of code that does something. 
uh, and it just helps keep things neat. So whatever I put in that, I can call it all at once with my call function. So if I make a new function here called uh, foo, now you can see I have this function block that I can drop a bunch of code into. Uh, and when I want to uh, actually run the code that lives inside of there, I will grab one of these call foo blocks and set that somewhere. So let's say I want to call foo whenever the A button or the B button is pressed, how about? So here on B button pressed, call foo. And then it's going to do whatever lives inside of there. Um, so I won't actually use that. I'm just going to ditch these off to the side. That throws them in the trash. Uh, so in my start, where'd my start go? Hello? If you lose things, you can zoom out with this uh, minus key. There's my start block. OK, so I'm going to zoom back in. Um, I think you can use, no, you can't use the, the wheel for that, it, the wheel scrolls. I thought you could. Uh, so I'm calling this Sparky setup. So what is Sparky setup? That is a function here that I put together a collection of blocks. And honestly, I started with these all just in the on start block. It was just fast and easy to, as I'm building it up, throw everything in there. And then when I realize, oh, this is working pretty well and I don't need all of this clutter, then I pushed it off over into a function on the side. Um, so when I call Sparky setup, just in the start block by saying call Sparky setup, it does the following. It creates my character sprite. So that's just this first block here in sprites, sprite, set my sprite to, and then an image and of a type. So I've gone into the little pixel editor here and created our little Sparky uh, 16. He's 16 by 11. He's a strange, strange shape, actually. How did I get him like that? I can't remember now. Um, so here's my, my 16 by 11. Could be 16 by 16 and just not fill it all in. But there's my Sparky uh, pixel art. And he's of the kind player. So you can create a kind player, projectile food, an enemy, or add new kinds. Um, then I'm setting his position. So he's uh, down near the bottom of the screen. So the screen is 120 uh, pixels from the top position of 0 and 120 to the bottom pixel. So I'm resting Sparky's uh, bottom of the sprite almost at the bottom at 108. And then he's in the middle, roughly, of the screen at, uh, at 80 pixels over on X. Uh, if you click on either of these numbers, you get a couple of things that you can use. You get a little slider, so you can um, choose a value. Or you get this crosshairs that lets you go over to the screen and set it exactly where you want it, or close to exactly where you want it, at least to get an idea, and then you can dial it in. Uh, then I'm setting up how I move Sparky. So Sparky moves with buttons. So this is from this controller. Uh, if I grab the, uh, where is it? Controller, is it in controller? Should be. Oh, it's the very first one. Move my sprite with buttons. So I dragged one of those in there, changed that drop down from my sprite to Sparky. Uh, and then I'm just setting the velocity on X to be uh, 100. So this is a sort of moderate speed and direction for the left and right keys. And I'm setting the Y to 0. So that means you can't move up and down, right? If you, if you think of a traditional Space Invader style game, you only move side to side. Uh, so that's one very simple, easy way with a single block to set up the, the controls for movement. And then I'm setting Sparky to stay in the screen. So this is, again, in the sprites category. There's a, uh, where is it? Set my sprite, stay in screen. Turn that on or off. There's a few different things you can do there. Uh, ghosting, auto destroy, destroy on wall, bounce on wall, and show physics. So I'm just using this simple stay in screen, and then you turn this little Boolean switch to on. And that means you don't have to worry about Sparky going off into the nether regions beyond where we can see with the camera. And I'm also setting up the life count to three. So that's what put the, puts those three hearts on the screen. Uh, the next thing I'm doing inside of the uh, on start block is calling this tile map setup. So the tile map, if you remember from last week, we, we built a, a game level, a, a side scrolling platformer level using a tile map. This time, in this function tile map setup, I've just got these two blocks set the tile map. And you can see I've just placed down in this 10 by 8. Uh, Screen, so that's 10 by 8 pixel that actually represents the whole uh, 
160 by 120, I can set down a block that essentially ends up taking up 16 pixels in real screen space, but it makes it easy to draw out walls and platforms. So I'm just using, uh, kind of arbitrarily picked the green brush, and I'm setting down a couple of uh, barriers. And then if we look at the next uh, block here, it's the set tile of the green index color. So wherever I've placed a, a block on my tile map that's green, we're going to see this piece of pixel art I made, which is a little strip uh, of a barrier with sort of a safety tape uh, theme to it. So if I go back to this tile map and uh, pick my pencil tool and the single pixel brush and the color green, I'm actually going to hold down, actually press and release L for line. And you'll see that's a, a recent update. That changes uh, my pencil tool to a line tool, which means wherever Wherever you click and drag, you're going to get a line, which is really nice. It allows you to make straight lines, diagonal lines, and so on. So I'm just going to drag across and make a full barrier now, which means I'm never going to be able to shoot uh, any of the IC chips. So you can see we've got a full barrier now, and my missiles are dying on impact, or my, par my uh, particles that I'm sending. Projectiles, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so You'll notice my art hasn't changed yet. That's just 16 by uh, 16 pixel image with an alpha channel. But this representation of where to put them has changed. So I can go back in here with my uh, eraser. Or you can erase by using the pencil and the uh, erase zero index. And I think it was something like that. Not quite, but uh, so now when we restart the game, we'll see the new uh, location of our barrier. Okay. Uh, now let's take a look um, at, we're running low on time, so I'll have to go a little faster through a couple of these things, but let's take a look at how our um, actual IC chip invaders work. So what I'm using here is this on-game update. Every three and a half seconds, what happens is uh, I create a projectile named chip one, chip two, and chip three. So you'll see they come in as, as rows of three. And that is a also in the uh, sprites category. So on sprites, we have uh, projectiles, these two projectiles blocks. And they're coming from the, uh, the wall. When it says from the side, it can be any, any side of the, of the stage. So it's not emitting from a character or, or another sprite, it's emitting from a point in the space. Uh, and that point in space is actually defined by this set chip x to, and I'm picking a random value of 0 to 49 for the first, 166 to 91, and 110 to 152. So that means they come out, all three of them come out at random spots in a third, third little columns across the screen. Uh, I set that particle, or that projectile rather, to the type enemy, and then I'm calling a little uh, animation and actually Todd Bot, uh, I was chatting with him earlier, uh, and he said, "Hey, you should uh, take a look at this awesome Space Invaders animation." I was like, "Ah, oh, man, the Space Invaders animation was very cool. Now I got to add animation to these chips." So uh, you'll see this function called Chip One Anim. What it does is it sets up an animation, just like we did a couple of weeks ago with Ruby, and we have these two frames. So we've got you'll see the little legs are two pixels each coming off the top and bottom. That's frame one, and frame two. I've just moved half of them uh, diagonal so that it looks like it's walking a little bit. So if you see uh, when, we, when we restart the game, you're going to see those little legs going back and forth uh, in a little animation mo motion. And so uh, every time the game updates, it allows two cycles of that. So the, the game update that I'm checking is, I think, every half second uh, for this uh, particle creation. And then I'm running at every quarter second a little uh, shift in those legs. So uh, let's see, we're almost out of time. So I want to see any other things that are unique. Some of this we've seen in some games before. A lot of this is uh, similar to example games that you'll find in Make Code Arcade. And I'm writing up a guide for it that'll have uh, all of these details. Uh, I guess the last thing that's of, of note is how do we actually blow stuff up? So when I press button A, uh, I am running this little condition to see, has a shot been fired? If a shot's been fired, I can't fire another shot. So that's how I'm waiting for my shot to be destroyed. Um, 
so I set the shot fired to true when I shoot one and I set it to false when that sprite gets destroyed, which is done using this block. When the destroyed sprite of kind projectile happens, then we set that flag to false. Uh, and then inside of here, I'm creating a projectile. I made a little sort of ESD lightning bolt spark. Uh, and I'm also playing a sound on that. So let's, let's actually I'm gonna pull over the uh, down shooter camera. And I haven't put this game onto the, the Pygamer uh, yet. Oh, I guess I could. Let's, let's try that. Sure. Uh, do I have a speaker on there? No, it's gonna be better with this one. So I got a speaker on here. So here's Sparky Invaders. And uh, you might be able to hear this. I'm gonna put my mic close. And let me switch views for you. Nope, oh, what's happening? Let me restart. I bet I broke it right before the show. There you go. And we can actually turn that volume up. That sounds pretty loud. Here we go. OK, so it's not that challenging. I'm definitely going to rack up a high score here. But uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave Sparky there for a minute to get uh, obliterated by his ESDs that do make it through. Uh, you also notice when I'm updating those um, IC chips, I'm adjusting them faster on Y than I am on X. So they kind of move at a lazy diagonal, which means if one is blocked by the barrier when it's uh, spawned on screen, it's going to make it past the barrier. Um, so you do have a chance to shoot it at some point, uh, and some of them will make it through. And, and yeah, there we go. It's playing a little game over music. Um, so hey, that's too many of me. There we go. Uh, so that is our uh, project for the week, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll be putting out a guide soon that'll allow you to to check out all the details of it. Uh, oh, last thing is mailbag. So. I mentioned, um, I'll, I'll stay here for this. I just uh, mentioned this on social media. I, I ordered a, um, a DS Lite, which was the sort of second generation Nintendo DS. Uh, I got it for $11 on eBay. It seems to work. Um, and I'm going to use this to make another uh, Game Boy Advance macro. So the one I showed on Show and Tell yesterday, this was my original DS Fat. That's the generation one. And I've removed uh, the upper screen and made a couple little modifications so that it'll play, um, well, it'll play without the top screen in place. And it plays uh, Game Boy Advance games directly when those are plugged in. It just jumps straight to that. Uh, so I'm going to kind of do the same with this, which I think has a slightly brighter screen. And for $11, you can't lose. So um, also big thank to Joe Bleep on Instagram, who's uh, been an inspiration for doing those kinds of projects. He makes some gorgeous stuff. So that's what's, that's what's happening uh, with the mailbag, someone had asked. So there you go. Uh, that's it for this week. I'm John Park for John Park's Workshop. Thank you very much. And uh, last reminder, if you want to go to Adafruit and pick up some of the good stuff we talked about today, uh, Pi Gamer, Pi Gamer LC, uh, is coming, Pi Badge, Pi Badge LC. Uh, check for them to be in stock. You might want to sign up to get an email alert when they are. And... Uh, also, my very cool Ethernet USB extender thing that I showed as project, product of the week. Um, just some ideas of things to check out. So that is it for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park. Goodbye.